In the Super Mario series, coins are usually tied to lives. Depending on the game, coins are also collectibles, giving players access to new levels and other forms of progress. We could talk for hours about the mechanical differences between all these games, but today we're going to focus on coins because they illustrate how to make collectibles interesting. A collectible becomes interesting when it affects health, power-ups, and or progress. So, does Mario need coins? The answer starts in 1981. Actually, there are no coins in Donkey Kong Arcade. Instead, Mario starts with three lives, and you can earn an extra life at 10,000 points per level. The player must jump to avoid hazards without running out of lives and losing their progress. The measure of success in the game is a high score. It's worth noting that high scores are a great social incentive to improve. Finishing a game, not getting a high score, but seeing that you're close to a high score could be that little extra push for a player to try again, offering quarters to the cold electronic judge of skill. High scores can also be soul crushing when you realize you will never be that good. The very first Mario Brothers multiplayer game changed the stakes. Enemies drop coins, but coins can be stolen by the other player, meaning they could increase their personal score using coins they didn't earn. The coin stealing dynamic complicates progress. Overall, you both want to beat enemies to get to the next level. But what if you keep getting your coins stolen and lose your rightful high score? Are you going to sabotage your teammate? Let them keep robbing you? Find a compromise? This is the first time we see adversarial co-op, or co opetition because it'll come back in the new Super Mario Bros. series. Super Mario Bros. laid the foundation for 2D Mario. The formula stays mostly intact for most of the 2D series. This section might feel simplistic, but I want to emphasize the design concerns of platformers. For this video, Let's agree that platformers are about mastering moves and clearing courses. In their purest form, those are the only things that matter in this genre. In this platformer, lives are important because they allow you to keep playing. If you keep playing, you'll master moves and clear courses. In Super Mario Bros., 1-ups can be collected up to 127 maximum. If you're interested, there's a list of 1-up maximums on the Super Mario wiki, but I'm not going to get into it. At any rate, lives prevent game over, and game over can be a momentary cutscene or a devastating conclusion depending on when you saved. When discussing Star Fox, Shigeru Miyamoto once said, Part of the fun of taking on a challenge is that the challenge has to be a hurdle that you overcome. Simply lowering the hurdle doesn't necessarily mean that the challenge will be fun. Games writer Raf Koster feels that fun in games arises out of mastery. It arises out of comprehension. It is the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun. With games, learning is the drug. I'll add that this process of mastery is marked by failure and reward. In Mario, failure means restarting at a save point, while reward includes health, power-ups, collectibles, and progress. Health is only a reward if the player needs it. That need is relative to the pace they lose health and the amount of progress at stake. In Mario, health is indicated by lives. If a player is struggling, they may try infinite 1-up glitches to make the game less punishing, because it will give them time before the threat of game over is imminent. Power-ups create a variety of movement and attacks. Some power-ups are timed, while others allow access to more health, collectibles, or levels. Collectibles are anything recorded on your save file that affects gameplay when counted or spent. The Mario platformers don't use collectibles to unlock levels until Yoshi's Island, and after that point, they become one of the main ways that progression is gated. Progress is any combination of clearing courses and these other rewards. In some Mario games, clearing levels earns more levels, but in other games, collectibles earn more levels. The first approach means skill is the barrier, and the second approach means exploration is the barrier. These approaches are a matter of taste, as some players prefer mechanical challenges and novelty, while others prefer backtracking for collectibles. Ideally, levels follow a difficulty curve, so players see a growing list of completed levels to match their increasing skill. If late stages are off the curve, the player might quit out of boredom or frustration. This requires playtesting to measure the skill required of players and, if needed, adjustments so the curve remains smooth. And that's basically the formula, so keep it in mind as we continue through the rest of the series. In Super Mario Bros. 2, coins provide access to the slot machine to gain lives. Coins are found in subspace after dropping potions, then trying to pick up plants. 
So rather than a number of coins adding up to a life, one coin amounts to one chance to earn lives. The slot machine minigame can make the earning of lives feel quite random, so it benefits the player to collect as many as they can. Super Mario Bros. 3 included persistent item storage throughout the game, rewarding skilled players with power-ups to keep progressing. Other elements like the world map, minigames, and themed levels then became iconic to the franchise. I wish I could hear the design discussions about what didn't make it into this game, because the variety of this decade of Mario is really notable. Within nine years, these are all platformers, but I'd argue the design differences are bigger than anything that we get after Super Mario Bros. 3. After this point, we keep most of these staples. I didn't know this before doing research on this video, but Super Mario Land sold 18 million copies. It basically feels like the intent was to run Mario on a handheld system, and if that's the metric, then this game hugely succeeded. Super Mario World introduced Dragon Coins, which provide lives during the adventure and reward completionists with a bonus screen at the end of the game. There are three incentives in Super Mario World. Coins for extra lives, goalposts for extra items, and secret exits to unlock new levels. In other words, health, power-ups, and progress. In Super Mario Land 2, the player can hold more than 100 coins. Because Yoshi's Island doesn't have a time limit or score, the player is encouraged to explore. While exploring in levels, you get a life for every 50 coins you collect. Red coins count for two coins. You also get bonus lives from minigames, which are more likely if you collect flowers throughout the level. This game was the first collectible-based Mario game, allowing players to backtrack for 100% of the flowers, red coins, and health stars. And honestly, so few games have as elegant a score system as the one in Yoshi's Island. On its own, 100 is a good number, but it's always divided the same way. 5 flowers, 20 red coins, 30 stars. As you continue getting 100%, you'll unlock final, extra challenging levels, rewarding the players who want to go the extra mile. If you're aware of score systems like this, please let me know, because I think it's really commendable. It's me, Mario! In Super Mario 64, coins and 1-ups are rare. This might be an effort to reduce objects on screen, but it also increases tension. Game over means resetting to the last, also rare, save point. Fixed save points are considered old school, but I appreciate that they add tension and release to level progression. The more progress made without saving, the higher the stakes become. Now Mario has a health bar which refills by grabbing coins or getting baptized. By making coins a more immediate health pickup rather than 1% of a life, they're a little more important. There's also a star in every stage for grabbing 100 coins. These effects are also kept in Mario Sunshine. By giving areas a fixed number value, the difficulty curve can be spaced out in a logical but still non-linear way. In a way, they're like experience points. Super Mario Sunshine adds blue coins into the mix, which trigger save points. Otherwise, they're a fixed collectible for completionists alongside the shines. Unfortunately, I can't really say too much about New Super Mario Brothers. Uh, you make progress by collecting star coins. Super Mario Galaxy introduces star bits in great number as a form of money to buy progress. In Galaxy 2, you can use coins to buy progress. I'm surprised this hasn't come up more often, but it's logical. Anything that's a collectible can be used to buy progress. The purple coin challenges keep the spirit of hunting for 100 coins alive, but they're restricted to just a few galaxies. <laughs> New Super Mario Bros. Wii is notable for being the first four-player Mario platformer. After this point, multiplayer options carry the spirit of adversarial co-op we first saw in the 1983 Mario Brothers. You can pick each other up to help or hurt progress, hide in bubbles if you want to skip a section, and opt out of a level completely if everybody bubbles at the same time. Which I find super funny and impractical, I'm super glad the designers allow this. Beyond that, it's pretty similar to New Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> 
in Super Mario 3D Land, star coins by progress. Otherwise, coins add up to a lives counter that maxes out at 999. <laughs> New Super Mario Bros. 2 turns coins into a parody. The goal in this game is to earn 1 million coins, which unfortunately turns out to be quite superficial. That could have been an executive decision, or it could have just not been interesting to the team that designed this game. I just think it's unfortunate that a game that was marketed on being all about coins actually had no implementation of currency. <laughs> So yeah, I wish I had more to say about New Super Mario Bros. U, but it shuffles the existing parts that we've been seeing throughout the series. It's a good platformer, but I think at this point the series was wearing out its welcome. In Super Mario 3D World, coins and green stars work similarly to the comet coins in 3D Land, but level progression is non-linear again. Super Mario 3D World probably works best as two-player co-op. This lives counter is shared, so if four people are doing poorly, they lose lives more quickly. On top of that, one player is given a crown for having the highest score per level. The chaos within each level can make it quite surprising who finished with the highest score, making 3 World an interesting and largely chaotic multiplayer experience. This is the first Mario game that uses stickers and notes between levels. It was the first step the developers took in fostering a sense of community around Mario platformers. Nintendo is famously limited in their online features, so I'm not mentioning the notes as something particularly innovative, but it shows their willingness to experiment as the Wii's life cycle came to an end. For the Super Mario Maker series, I want to mention the 100 Mario Challenge. Mario as a roguelite, but rather than RPG elements, you unlock costumes for your own level designs. High scores, best times, and coins are recorded, harkening back to social incentives of the arcade era, and show Nintendo stretching out to engage the smaller audience of Wii U owners. Online features stay intact for the new Mario adventures after this point, and although they're often supplementary rather than fundamental changes, they're nice. It's nice to see how many people are playing Mario games. Mario Maker also reveals level design methodology. Things like clear rate, death hotspots, and comments are all useful for players in the moment and are similar to playtesting tools that Mario designers have probably been using for ages. Super Mario Odyssey! Super Mario Odyssey is a leap into modern gaming because his life now costs 10 coins. How's that for inflation? Or deflation. It's telling that it took the designers this long to get rid of 1-ups, and raises an important point about branding and game design. When Mario was created, lives were an important feature of the coin-hungry arcade machines, but became irrelevant once games could save after every level. It's interesting to look at all the 1-up minigames throughout the series, and imagine farming for different collectibles with the live system thrown out the window. And that's exactly what happens in Odyssey. Coins purchase moons, health, and outfits. Moons unlock new levels, power-ups are power-ups, and though I'm sure cosmetic outfits aren't for everyone, the invisibility cap makes for some impressive novelty runs. Mario Odyssey is definitely one of the longest adventures in the series, but it stretches the quality of some of the moon objectives. Odyssey was created early in the lifespan of the Nintendo Switch and shared the system-selling burden with Zelda Breath of the Wild, another quite long adventure for completionists. There's a general belief among the industry, I'm not sure if consumers believe it as much, that a game is worth more if it takes more hours. I understand there may have been pressure to stretch the content in these games, so I'll link a cold take video that I think addresses this whole situation quite well. I'm not sure if this next game went under the radar, but Bowser's Fury has a ton of awesome ideas. Lives are thrown out the window, 100 coins get you a cat suit, and items are hidden all over the map, turning power-ups into the new currency. And I appreciate that you can only have five of each item, because too many items would decrease tension in difficult areas. And you'll notice throughout the games, the amount of items that they offer the player has a direct effect on how tense the platforming experience can feel. When approaching difficult areas, you might take more damage and lose power-ups, thereby limiting your moveset. To make progress, you need sufficient skill, or you leave that area to stock up on items that would expand your moveset. It benefits the player to remember the power-up locations, so they're encouraged to explore and pay attention to their environment. So far, it's the most cohesive 3D exploration-based open-world Mario game, and I'm very curious what lessons they're going to take from this game and apply in future 3D adventures. 
In Super Mario Bros. Wonder, yellow coins are lives, purple coins buy collectibles and power-ups, and wonder seeds buy progress. Difficulty ratings are included that help players decide which path they want to take forward, really continuing that tradition of non-linearity. I really appreciate the level completion check marks and wonder seed detector as a way to minimize looking up secrets online. Hint systems always run the risk of removing a sense of discovery from the player, but including them mitigates that feeling of, how was I supposed to know that? That can plague games that are filled with secrets. However, that frustration is very individual, as some players like experimenting and exploring maps to discover things on their own, while others find that approach tedious. Like the Mario Maker series, Mario Wonder gives players options, rather than keeping them stuck on one playstyle. Every game creates a value system based on positive and negative incentives. It's hard for long-running series like Mario to rework its incentives because there's a balance between enticing new players while keeping existing ones. Super Mario Bros. had a clarity of vision that carried through the side-scrollers and survived the jump to 3D. But looking at the overall series, I don't know if it really needs coins. As a thought experiment, imagine there were no coins in a given Mario game. If you went through each of the games we've talked about, some games would suffer more than others from that removal. If the coin's main purpose was to guide the player and add aesthetic interest, the removal is superficial. But in more recent games like Odyssey, Bowser's Fury, and Super Mario Wonder, the removal would be huge, as coins are so key to the sense of reward in those games. When coins add up to lives, they are tied to difficulty. They're tied to the tension the player feels as they gather lives and progress through the adventure. But there's a threshold. If the player collects health faster than they lose it, or stays at maximum health long before the end of the game, they're far above the game's difficulty curve. When coins are tied to power-ups, collectibles, and progress, they are currency. Of course, the Mario RPGs use coins as a very straightforward currency, but it's been less consistent in the mainline Mario adventures. Health and power-ups make games easier, while collectibles offer a visual record of progress. Clearing courses means seeing new environments, enemies, NPCs, with an increase in difficulty or complexity. In any game, it's interesting to see if currency keeps pace with those rewards, or if it feels superfluous. In other words, when the player wants something new, do they have to backtrack and collect currency, or can they continue without interruption? Backtracking isn't a bad thing, it's just different, and appeals to different types of players. In the next 3D adventure, I'm curious if there's going to be a system like the flower badges from Mario Wonder, something accessible from a menu or shop that dramatically changes how the player moves through the world. This would be quite different from the capture abilities in Mario Odyssey that were all location-specific and kind of limited in their effects. So, should Mario platformers have RPG-style progression systems? Probably not. I'd argue that any system that encourages a player to experience as much of a game as possible is effective, but there's definitely room to use coins in ways that keep the spirit of platforming alive, the spirit of mastering moves and clearing courses. What do you think? Are coins important in Mario games? Why or why not? What are some currency systems and platformers that you like or dislike? There are links in the description for further reading. Otherwise, thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it with a friend. If not, share it with an enemy. If you loved it, consider joining Vicky over at patreon.com slash bitbutton. Take care.